Great, so we'll get started. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Nicholas Barr. I'm a marriage and family therapist. I've been working with um, Harmony Place for over a year now. And uh, I've had the great opportunity uh, to really develop and put into practice a lot of the stuff that I've been developing, learning, um, training in for the last few years. So uh, it's been really special to kind of have an incubator to, uh, to really advance my specialization in Harmony Place. So thank you. Both Mark and Lori, it's been really great. Um, okay. Uh, my background, we'll just quickly go through that. I, I went to Nairobi University, it's a Buddhist university in Boulder. Um, they have a somatics graduate program there and an undergraduate specialization. Um, I went to California Institute of Integral Studies up in San Francisco. There's another uh, graduate program at JFK in Oakland that also has a somatics program. Both of them have great continuing ed programs there. Uh, workshops, that kind of thing. Um, also did EMDR here in Birmingham, and uh, some work with the late Bill Bowen. Um, so, you know, because we've been sitting all day, um, as we've been trained to do since we were very little in classrooms, um, we're all very good at it. But I, I, I think that comes at the cost of perhaps feeling, and connect, feeling connected, being connected to um, anything below our neck, perhaps. Um, so I want to give us a chance now to uh, actually practice a little bit to start us off for the day, or the, the last part of the day. Um, so this is probably my favorite little experiential I do every week with, with my groups, my somatic groups, and my mindfulness groups, just to bring the level of safety and, and containment and grounding in the room uh, which then allows the patients to access mindfulness or the skills we're practicing or the more challenging subjects we're addressing more uh, whole, wholeheartedly with more resources. Yeah. So I think this is a, not only just for us in the room together to maybe practice uh, some somatics, but also if you want to keep that observer in the background, oh yeah, I could do this with my patients too. Yeah. Um, part of that, uh, especially with trauma, is I like to be very invitational, right, just to respect boundaries. So you do not have to do this you're welcome to sit out. Um, but I only ask that you are not disruptive. You can do whatever else you want, just don't disrupt others. Um, so you're welcome to let your, uh, kind of find yourself as a posture or a seat where you feel settled in. I call it stable and erect. You want both of those qualities, both of stability like a mountain, but also that strong peak where you feel tall and alert and awake, especially this late in the afternoon. Um, and you can, if you feel comfortable, let your eyes come to close, or you can lower your gaze. And already we can simply just notice the quality of our thoughts. We don't have to change them. Just noticing, you know, are they focusing on the future, the past? Think about the traffic on the way home. And the fun excitement this weekend planned. Whatever it is, we don't have to change them again. We're just noticing whatever the thoughts are doing, right? And if we were doing this with our patients, we might spend a little longer here, but we're going to keep moving along. And just noticing now, bringing our attention to the places in the body where we are in contact with the chair. So this is the surfaces of the body where in which we're in contact. And we can feel our body touching the chair. There may be particular sensations here of warmth, of tickly prickliness, of flowing, a stuck, a heaviness, lightness. We're just noticing whatever particular sensations are there. We may even notice what it feels like to allow the chair to hold us, kind of dropping and yielding our weight into the chair and inviting the chair to buoy us up, to spring us up. Just noticing the particular sensations there in the contact. And we're moving now our attention down to the surfaces of our feet, the bottom surface of the feet where we're in contact with the ground. Again, nothing fancy here, just the whatever sensations we notice warm, cool, tight, loose, flowing, stuck. 
the heels, the arches, the ball, the toes. And we're going to direct our attention to the second left toe. The second left toe, just notice whatever sensations you feel there, really focusing that attention in on the second left toe. If you need to wiggle it, you're welcome to just to kind of add some sensation. Now from the very tight focus of the second left toe, I'll invite you to open your attention now just into a diffuse awareness of the entire body. And notice anywhere that stands out, any particularly strong sensations, could be tension in the back, the neck, could be burbling in the, in the belly. Anywhere you notice it. And now direct your breath there. So this is the first time we're linking our breath up now. And invite yourself to breathe directly into that particular place. <coughs> if you want, you can imagine sprouting like a mouth or a blow hole right over that particular place in the body, so you're breathing directly into it. And if you want, you can pick another sensation, another place in the body, and again, send your breath there. Nothing else to do, just sending our breath to that place in the body. Let's see. Good, we can let go of the body awareness and instead just direct ourselves to extend the duration of our exhale. We're trying to prolong how long it takes us to evacuate the air from our body. One way to do this is to constrain the, the exhale by puckering up the lips as though we're breathing out through a straw. Call it straw breathing. Just Nice and slow, letting it out nice and slow. Good. Now we might bring up a, a recent memory, a positive memory, or it could be something distant, but a strong memory where we felt particularly safe, particularly loved, particularly valued. Maybe we felt powerful. might paint the picture a little bit more for yourself, really noticing what the surroundings were like. And then again, directing your attention back and noticing how that's shifted any of the sensations in the body. Maybe there's a new quality in breath. Maybe your posture is shifted or there's less tension or more tension. And then coming back to that memory again, or the image that represents the memory of that positive experience we had. And just inviting some nice full breaths as we think about that. And we're going to enhance this. If you want, again, invitation only, you can place your right palm very gently on top of your heart. Now to find your heart, you can t take your left clavicle, your collarbone, and come down about three ribs. Sometimes a little higher than we think it is. And just really softly placing that hand there, noticing what it feels like for the hands to touch the body and the body to touch the hand. So we have a simultaneous sensations going on with the body touching the hand and the hand touching the body. And then with the other palm, placing that over your navel, very gently over the navel. Again, invitation, if you want, you can. We just want to invite a sense of softness as though we were holding a, a young sleeping puppy. Just a real gentle softness. 
Noticing the sensations again, the warmth of the hands touching the body and the body touching the hands. <coughs> and the final little bit here is where we turn this into a self-hug, where we take the left hand and dig it as far as we can into that armpit of the right armpit. And then with the right hand, we put it on the arm, so it becomes a bit of a self-hug. Just letting the shoulders release as much as you can as you breathe nice and fully. Okay, that's it. You're welcome to come back in the room. Yeah. So we just did a brief little tour of different uh, little different skills there. Um, uh, let's see, what did we do? We started with, anybody remember? Thoughts do whatever they want. We didn't have to change them, we just let the thoughts do whatever they wanted. Really nice way to establish mindfulness very quickly, right? Get into that non-judgmental perspective. And from there, we then noticed where we're in contact with the chair. So immediately, we're bringing our, our attention to our peripheral nervous system, yeah? And hoping to ground and settle us into the present moment. <clears throat> yeah? Then coming down to the bottom of the feet, even more peripheral and really quite neutral. It's a nice, safe place to always bring our attention if, if we're feeling floaty or dissociated or out of the room or uh, starting to get anxious can bring the sensations, the focus of the sensations of the feet to the foreground. Then from that we focus it even tighter onto the toe. Now that actually takes a bit of effort to really refine the attention. I think that's a really nice way, again, to uh, practice uh, more subtle and finely tuned attention in the present moment, yeah, without having to, um, you know, uh, stray from the here and now or our connection with ourself, yeah. Uh, then we opened up to a diffuse sense. We noticed whatever was on the foreground of our experience, wherever you notice it. Usually it's my neck and my back for me, my, my tummy. Um, and sent our breath there. Sometimes it shifts our experience, sometimes it doesn't. It can be soothing. Sometimes people with headaches find this really helpful just to bring their, their breath and send it to the headache, yeah? Um, so just a quick survey. Um, we did a positive memory where we, or when we prolonged the breath. We noticed what focusing on a positive memory did to our body. You had to track how our, our body organizes the association with that memory or that image. And then we placed our hands on our body and maybe had a physiological response to having those hands placed on that particular places. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions or thoughts about that as we get started? Uh, any anything that felt particularly relaxing or kind of like didn't work so well for you? Yeah? I had never felt my own heartbeat. Hmm. You know, I know it's there, but I never put my hand so that I could feel my heart yes. for my fingers. Good, so you, you've never felt your own heartbeat, no. but here we are, you get to actually sit there and connect to it, right? It's right. amazing. Yeah. Every moment of our life, that heart's been pumping, and we can actually kind of have a, a, a direct line of communication to it. Yeah. Um, so this becomes really useful information for not only us as, as practitioners when we're sitting with traumatized folks, um, but also for our clients to learn how to track their own physiological responses, yeah? And let them know that something's coming and maybe they need to divert with some coping skills, yeah? Cool. So um, there's lots we can mine from that and maybe we might think of some of these tools later on when we're talking about techniques I need to kind of scoot, yeah? Okay, just what we're doing, why don't we just skip that? Because we're gonna do it. So, what is somatics? Somatics generally is, um, hmm. I'd say when we break it down, it's the felt sense of being a body. It's not becoming aware of the body, as though we're this brain that needs to like oversee the wild phenomenon of, the, of, our, of our corpse, you know? But instead, it's about becoming aware through the body. Yeah, and that each system of the body has its own kind and quality of awareness. 
its own kind of consciousness, yeah? That it's, um, it's trying to dethrone the central nervous system as the only kind of consciousness that we have, and instead study the other forms of consciousness that are distributed throughout the body, that system, uh, the vast system of intelligence we have in the body, yeah? And it's quite, it's quite diverse um, as a field. Um, yeah, you can keep going. I think originally um, most indigenous knowledge would work under the paradigm that we, it's mind and body are one, that there is unity between these two things, and slowly through our Western tradition, um, there's been this schism that's been created uh, between mind and body. We think it was quite different. Um, that could have, you know, uh, something to do with religion in, in the West and looking at the feminine and, and the body and the earth as, as evil and sinful and etc. etc. It could have things to do with mean, chicken or egg, right? Uh, reductionism and, and mechanism, uh, materialism. Um, but later, in the late 1800s and, and in the early 1900s, the philosophers were studying the body and what it meant. So Herschel and, and Merleau-Ponty we're trying to figure out what, what are these phenomena that we experience in the body, and um, how can we understand them, not in a way that we could through a microscope, but really through our own felt experience, right, our lived experience. It was only later that that was then adopted into the healing art form. So it was first kind of the philosophers who were tinkering away at it, which sometimes seems to be the way of the world. Here's a bunch of names of people. If you're interested, I put them on your slide, just because each of them has their own unique kind of take on, and this is not by any means comprehensive. Every time I put a name down, I had to like not put 20 others. You know, there's so many people in this field; it's really vast. Um, and boy, um, anybody that really stands out. So uh, Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen, she's still alive and still teaching. She's awesome. I really recommend looking up her website, uh, Body Body Mind Centering with Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen. Um, She's, she looks at each particular system of the body and investigated it for years, of uh, what the felt quality and the intelligence of each system, uh, the heart, the lungs, the veins, the lymph, all of that really intricate work and very uh, uh, meticulous. Um, hmm. Yeah, and so finally we're catching up, right? I think now uh, physics is finally catching up with quantum mechanics, uh, quantum theory. Um, but I think the whole field in general is finally understanding that we can't really keep these categorically so separate anymore. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so one of the things we were doing there with uh, the practice when we started was tapping into our felt sense. This is, a, I would say, a core feature across most of the somatic therapies out there is um, that uh, particular quality that we experience of our body um, now, I like this drawing here um, because it really highlights why it's important for treating trauma. Because when we're traumatized, we stop being able to really sense much of, the, of, of our wholeness in the body, but instead we're really on threat alert. We're looking, we're orienting for threat outside. Yeah, and what my little toe feels like is quite irrelevant, you know, um, for that. So simply by practicing Peripheral, peripheral awareness, we can be teaching our, our clients and ourselves um, to tap back into that sense of wholeness and unity of being connected to our body. Yeah? Now that can be really terrifying for obvious reasons. Um, right? Don't go straight for the heart center or the throat, you know? Don't. Just don't do that first, you know? Start with the bottom of the feet. It's a very nice neutral place to establish some, some kind of a felt sense awareness, right? Or the contact of the, of, the, of the body on the chair, yeah? So just languaging, because we don't typically have much vocabulary or language to describe these, these particular sensations of the body. I wanted to give you uh, a list of different vocab words of describers for these particular sensations. You may have heard me saying things like heavy or light or hot or cold or thick or thin or flowing or stuck or constricted or loose, all of these are really useful to have in our uh, nomenclature really readily 
if we're going to start studying sensations, yeah? And we're going to ask our patients to study sensations, so we have to be able to model and support them in, the, in their process of studying their own felt sense, yeah? Um, I think it's really cool. The Buddha, uh, back when he was studying sensations, broke it down elementally, so each element had a different quality of sensations. Um, I think that's all I hear. Yeah, I mean, fire, air, earth, water, but the fire being temperature, what's the temperature of the sensation? Air being, is it moving or is it stuck? The water, is it, I'm not quite sure actually, but he had a whole system of all of them. So there's many ways we can conceptualize um, all these different qualities and sensations. I think the biggest one is that many patients won't realize they're having sensations if it's that kind of uniform, subtle, mundane hum of sensations. They'll be like, I'm not feeling anything. I, well, actually, it might just be very boring and mundane. You might not be feeling much, just this little tiny vibration. And that's, that's it. That's just, it's never, there's never a lack of some kind of vibration in the body because all the cells and molecules are constantly whirring around, right? So even the most subtle sensation is uh, precious and something to study and be, be careful and notice. Um, we don't just want to notice the big, giant, big <coughs> sensations that have a sign on them that say, hello, I'm here, you know, beware, or whatever. Um, cool, so that's why this is here, it's really. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about how our nervous system uh, works with arousal. Um, before we go any further, any thoughts about sensations and the stuff we've done so far? Okay, you're following. Yes, cool. Okay, so hmm, maybe I'll say a tall story. So uh, I lived on a commune up in Oregon for a summer doing a permaculture de uh, design certificate um, in my you know college years, and um, as you do, you know. Um, and my friend and I were smoking a little grass out in the in the forests, as you do on a commune in Oregon, and, um, <laughs> and probably other places. And um, we kind of got lost uh, out of these forests in Oregon. There's a lot of trees, um, and they become quite you know confusing uh, at times. So we we happened upon this green field. This pasture was mowed, looked really nice and inviting. Like oh my god, finally someplace safe. Maybe there's a gingerbread house over there or something else. Like and um, instead of a gingerbread house, there's a giant black animal running towards us, right? And the next thing I knew is I was like about a mile away. You know, I was somehow a mile away. And in re recollecting what had happened, uh, my friend and I had just bolted. Uh, and, and I remember running through trees. You know, like there's a tree there, but it didn't really matter. You could just kind of run through it, you know? And, or a bush, or whatever it is, and you just go through it. And then eventually, like, we got to our senses about a mile away and said, you know what? That was a dog. <laughs> not a bear, you know, we were fine. Um, but that part of the brain wasn't there yet. It was not online. That's, that's what we're talking about with this nervous system arousal. We really need to be able to trust it. I mean, I'm happy I ran from the dog. You know, it was a scary dog. And didn't want to be there anymore. Um, <laughs> Nothing to do with the weed. <laughs> that may have impaired my 19-year-old frontal cortex. Uh, in a already, um, already impaired frontal cortex. Okay. So uh, classically, we, we break down the nervous system into two different branches, and um, we want to have a healthy balance between these two. On the left side. We have the parasympathetic, and this is where we're hoping to be most of the time. This is the rest and digest nervous system. And there's just kind of, um, you know, some blue, uh, you know, um, icons for all the different organs and how they're affected in the parasympathetic. This is useful and probably pretty intuitive. Um, the fact that when we're in our rest and digest safe nervous system, uh, blood is flowing to the intestines, we can, you know, digest easily get our nutrients from our food. Blood can flow slowly, so the heart beats slow, the, the lungs aren't breathing fast, et cetera, et cetera, right? The pupils don't have to be dilated because they're not searching for threat. Um, and we can have sexual arousal in these places, right? Um, but once we go over into the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight nervous system, suddenly arousal doesn't make any sense neurologically. 
right, or, or uh, adaptively. We want to run from that big black mammal that's running towards us. Um, and then, again, our digestion isn't really important either. We might literally evacuate our bowels, shit our pants, to uh, avoid um, wasting any blood that could be better used running or fighting from the threat. Yeah. So, um, again, it's really good to normalize these systems with our patients, that like this is just how our body reacts to threat. Like, you're not weird, right? This is smart, this is evolutionarily adaptive, and uh, the question is, does it get stuck, right? Are we then stuck in that system? That's when it becomes maladaptive, yeah? Cool, um, trying to get quickly through this. Uh, we have the, the triune brain, three different levels of the brain, in the very kind of center of the brain, we have the youngest, sorry, the oldest part of the brain, the reptilian part of the brain is saying here it's 500, 500 million years old, right? crazy old. Um, and its response to threat is to freeze, to imitate death, to immobilize. Yeah? Super old school, like what a lizard does or a possum does, or what a deer does in the headlights. Yeah? Now the limbic system is a middle part of the brain, again, pretty old, but not as old as the reptilian. This is where we're going to be more active. We're going to mobilize towards the threat, either running or fighting. Yeah. And then the most recent adaptation is this brilliant neocortex that we have sitting on top of the other two. And there, we don't actually need to fight. We don't need to run. We don't need to freeze. If, if we can use our social skills, our social engagement system to navigate this, we'll, we'll save ourselves a ton of energy. We'll just talk it out, right? We're gonna talk it out and uh, try to figure out the threat um, in a more creative fashion, yeah? Cool. Um, but it's really hard to be in this neocortex if the fight or flight system is activated. This is perhaps my favorite model right here, and I could spend, I don't know, forever talking to you about it and getting curious about it. But this comes from uh, Dr. Stephen Porges. He's in Cleveland. He's awesome. And um, he has given us these three different segments and broken it down. So it's not just these two wings, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, but he's looking at the very particular nerve that uh, is regulating this arousal. And it's the vagal nerve, the vagus nerve. Um, and on the bottom we have what I would say self in an IFS sense. We have that safety, the curiosity, the calm, all of the qualities that we can work it out by using all of our neurological creativity and apparatus that's sitting on top of our brain, right? Um, but once our arousal, our physiological arousal gets up and we're starting to activate that fight or flight system, uh, now we're either going to flip into fight or flight and all of the associated qualities that those two have. And we're going to lose a lot of the creativity and openness and groundedness, the ability to talk it out once we flip up into this state. Yeah? Um, there's all the particulars here of what they're doing and really interesting. Um, we'll come back to them. Now, at some threshold here, that dotted line, I have a, I have a laser pointer, but it's just not as fun. Um, at that dotted line, it's the threshold between being capable of responding and being incapable. Powerless over powerlessness. Or powerless, yeah, you got it. So, at some point, our nervous system judges that there's no point in fighting or running. We're just going to have to dissociate pretty darn hard here. Yeah? Numb ourselves out and try to minimize the actual harm or damage done to our consciousness. Yeah? So, uh, we can see this with prey animals when, say, the uh, leopard gets the gazelle, right, and gets the firm grip around the neck. Eventually, they just, they just go into this freeze state. And um, it increases their ability to stay numb, right? So we suddenly get all the, the pain, uh, the endorphins um, rushing in to help us just deal with it. We might have kind of an out-of-body experience, a depersonalization, de derealization experience. We might even fully faint just to not be present at all, yeah? 
and really tricky here, is that all of these motor impulses that are happening here to fight or to run away, they're not going anywhere when we freeze. They get stuck in the system. Yeah? This is, a bit of, this is like the burdens, if you will, of, of these parts, of these protectors, that when we successfully run away from a big black mammal in the forests of Oregon one faded summer, um, we actually used all of that cortisol, all of the activating fight or flight uh, arousal and uh, hormones um, to their completion. And it was like a mile away. And so the muscles had a, had a chance to really process and work through all that stuff. Right? Same thing if I got in some kind of, if I had to fight with a dog, I don't, I wouldn't fight with a dog, I would run. Um, we would be able to process all that stuff. But if we quickly had a surge of, of that adrenaline and cortisol and all that good stuff, but we immediately felt powerless in responding to it, all of that impulse to action has been frozen, stuck. Yeah? And we're just thrown up into this dissociation. Now, we can see that this might happen chronically to kids growing up, right? Where they are around these giants who they depend on for everything, and um, they really are quite powerless <laughs> with. So they might flip into this freeze and faint state a lot. Yeah. Um, there's a lot here. Any thoughts about it? Questions? It happened to humans because they use the condition of freeze. Okay. The, the, let's say they suddenly getting into this very dangerous situation. Or even car accident, uh -huh. they, do they getting into that mode of freeze? Totally, absolutely, totally. Yeah, and I'm seeing everybody, almost everybody shaking their head or maybe even personally remembering it or from their clients. It's, um, thank God we do. I should say, like, hallelujah, we have this response and we need to, again, normalize it, validate it. Um, this is a way of maybe allying with a, with a protector, a manager or a firefighter to validate it. It was smart, it was an adaptive response then. Like, thank God we can freeze and faint. What if you really had to be around that whole time when you were being taken advantage of? Or when you were being humiliated, you know? Did you really want to be present fully for that? No. You know, no, 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 of course not. Right, there, you were in an impossible situation. So this is really an adaptive strategy for our nervous system to be able to manage what is otherwise totally intolerable. Yeah? Cool, so other things that happen here is that we're bonding and belonging down here. This is where the self is happening, where we're able to have the healthy attachment system going on, where we can connect with oxytocin and vasopressin, the bonding and belonging um, hormones coming from the heart. Now, for the avoidant, um, the avoidant attachment style, my guess is they're pretty much usually in, up in these two, right? And if, when they start to thaw, they start freaking out, so they thaw again. Wait, they thaw and then they freeze again to make sure that they don't have to face all of that pent up, stored up stuff that's been waiting for them from past traumas, yeah? The disruptive attachment relationship. Yeah, so what we're trying to do is actually hold um, our nervous system as a scaffold for our patients. We want to become masters of regulating our own, and you may, I mean, if you're in practice as a therapist or clinician, you're already doing this. You know what it feels like to get activated emotionally, and your arousal to get activated in the room, and no doubt you have all types of an implicit or explicit ways of regulating your nervous system to stay present and grounded with your patient. Now that very quality, as we do that with our patient, we are unwittingly actually lending our nervous system to theirs. We're helping them feel safer and grounded and bringing down their arousal. We're safe here, it's okay to talk about this. Yeah? Cool. Okay, another way of conceptualizing this is that we have a window of tolerance. This is a more popular um, concept. So, um, it's weird because from the previous one, that blue section of the freeze has now been dropped to the bottom. So that's just the only kind of weird part about putting these next to each other, is the freeze and faint is now squarely on the bottom of the graph, but the same x, y axis where you have the arousal schedule on the left, and then time on the, on the bottom. 
And the idea here is that we have only a certain amount of arousal that we can really handle while keeping that social engagement system going, while being able to stay open and creative and have the self lead. Yeah? So I broke it down here. On the bottom, we'll, we'll be in the freeze and faint, and up top, we'll be up in the fight or flight. Now, with our traumatized patients, this becomes uh, skinnier. The window um, will shrink, yeah, because the episode of trauma was so terrible that they no longer could handle that arousal, yeah? I like these little illustrations with the, um, the cute little, little penguin. And, uh, and I, I found these just really online really easy. You can search them. Uh, there's even a link. I guess you can't see the link. But if you're just to Google image these things, it's really great for handouts for your clients, right? These are meant for psychoeducational handouts. Because clients need to know, I think it's very helpful for them to know how their nervous system is affected by trauma. Yeah? <clears throat> of course, there's paradise to be had. Um, and what we're trying to do with our clients is help them stay within the window, yeah? But also how to open the window back up. That's my next slide here. Um, proud of this one. So the metaphor I use with patients is like we're in a bathtub and the water starts getting hot and we can dissociate, we can numb out, not realizing it gets getting hotter, or we can turn on the cold, right? So we need to learn how to regulate our nervous system arousal by tracking its uh, signs and, and signals that it's starting to heat up, we're starting to have higher arousal, and then putting into place um, skills, techniques, um, even just talking about something hopefully is going to bring down that arousal, just activating that social engagement system or noticing our sensations in the periphery or prolonging the duration of our exhale. Any of these particular techniques to regulate the nervous system back down into the optimal arousal zone. Yeah. Now the, the other implication of the window of tolerance is that once we've learned really good regulatory skills that we can turn up and down the temperature of our our nervous system. We want to be able to st stick around longer for hotter water and colder water without dissociating. Yeah, to expand what we can deal with, what we can handle. Um, these are different phases of, of the treatment. The first, really much more about stabilization. How can we get them to not just use alcohol or their behaviors, their maladaptives, you know, to minimize the burden on those particular managers or protectors to um, to give them new skills to be more, more adaptive now and how to regulate. Yeah. Cool. Any thoughts about the bathtub or anything so far? I'm just thinking about the attachment lecture previously You got it. So it's seeing how a child is able to fight with their parent without the parent um, hurting the child, but like being able to re receive it and then respond effectively, or to have the child be able to run away and, and the adult not um, take it personally, but say, okay, they need their space. I'm just gonna make sure they're safe, but they can, they can take their space. If that's happening, that we're, we're allowing them to have their fight or flight responses, their own boundaries with that. Um, so they don't have to rely on the more primary, you know, primitive, Defenses, exactly. Um, and then I guess here we don't need to sit in the bathtub with them. Maybe it's as though it's like I guess what's that story with um, Jackie Chan? And they're in the West, so it's like they're cowboys. You really seen them? They're sitting in the two bathtubs next to each other. It's really funny. They're like, oh, it's just a hilarious scene. Uh, no, <laughs> Shanghai. Yeah, nice, excellent. So, so they're sitting in their bathtubs next to each other. It's so cute, you know, bonding. And um, and so we are like we are like that with our patients. We have our own therm thermometer. We have to be regulating our own arousal with our patients, noticing our countertransference, if you will, and then not only uh, implicit, like trying to regulate ourselves and tolerate the affect we're experiencing, but then we're actually lending them just by being in the room with them, uh, lending our voice contacting with contact statements, um, uh, maybe even encouraging practices of explicit 
coping skills, we are lending our nervous system to them so they can learn to regulate better. This is really what infants were being, what parents were doing with infants. That's that really primitive reparenting you're talking about, where we're organized, otherwise the fractured parts of our experience, the affect of our experience, or somatic arousal of our experience, that otherwise was so intolerable to the parent, the parent couldn't handle it or organize it either. We need to be, you know, uh, master parents in the way that we can handle and organize all of that un un disorganized stuff, yeah? Cool. Uh, this is my, my particular term I will take credit for. Uh, the Goldilocks zone of proximal discomfiture. Yeah, it's a good balance of like, like really mundane Goldilocks and then proximal discomfiture. I really good. Anyway, thank you. Got, got a nod. Thank you. <laughs> it's the first time it's been publicly unveiled. But, yeah, thank you. It's very simple. <laughs> so growth happens when we're uncomfortable, but not when we are too uncomfortable. So we have to repeat that ah, ad nauseum with our patients that like, you know, look, this is going to be uncomfortable. You're going you're to have to try new things and take risks. You're going to feel things you don't want to feel and think things you haven't want to think. And notice sensations that you have tried to, tried to deny, right? Good. So we have to learn to track uh, the nonverbal signals that we're getting from our patients to make sure that we're not throwing them into the deep end, but we're keeping them in that blue-green area. Yeah. Cool. Um, quick uh, overview of, of the Basque dissociation model came up in the 80s, guy named Bennett Braun. I don't know. Uh, it's a very sophisticated and I don't know. I found it kind of hard to crack when I actually read the primary literature on this. Um, but the basics are that we can break down our experience into these four different categories um, in the acronym of BASC. So first of all, behaviors uh, for the affect, sensations, and knowledge. Now when we're dissociating, we cut off those pieces. We psychically uh, you know, fracture them off of ourselves. They exiled them. Um, so behaviors that looks like we just we just don't go there anymore, right? Or you know I don't have sex because it's too activating, or you know I I'm not, I don't hug, you know, or whatever it is. We're just actively uh, ablating, cutting away that from our experience to avoid having to experience it. Yeah. Same thing with affect, like uh, lysithymia, or just yeah I don't do sadness. Anybody heard that one before? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I, I recently had one. I live on the top 20% of emotions. That's what I got from somebody. Like, very explicit. Like, I'm going to see your metrics on that one. And uh, sensations. Like, we might have whole swaths of our physiology where we are unable to notice and feel any sensations. Where that chronic uh, freeze and numbness has just completely cut us off from places in our body, of our affect in our body. Yeah. And then finally, knowledge just and easier we don't remember. I don't know. But the pressure of pushing all of that aside, all that dissociative pressure, uh, can create anxiety, obviously, depression, right, all of it. But then also, the it feels like um, to every action there is a equal and opposite action. So we have to have the intrusions that pop them back into our awareness, um, triggered by some kind of uh, associative. Um, element. So again, we have reenactments that happen when we're avoiding it. This can just happen like our body takes over and we're just watching ourselves behave in a certain way. Um, affect where we're flooding, you know, we, we're completely in the shame spiral. It's up, this feeling, we don't like it, we don't like it, but here it is, ah, 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 we're not breathing regularly. It's like a really disorganized affect state. This is from Pat Ogden's work. Um, she's student, she came from the Hakomi school, uh, but she founded sensory motor psychothera psychotherapy. This is her text. It's awesome. I cannot recommend it more highly. It is comprehensive. Uh, it's called Trauma and the Body, aptly. Um, and if I could just make this a presentation, I would, because it's, it's just, it's excellent. Um, and I've done my best to do her justice. She does, she has an institute that does trainings as well, so definitely recommend checking her out. Or if you're interested in your own therapy, uh, to, to start getting investigatory on your own 
somatic experience. It's a great, great thing to look up, somatic experiencing or sensory motor therapists out there. So she um, recognizes that this is not a stage-based kind of model, but a phase. We're going to have to circle back around on earlier stages as we move into the, the deep, dark parts of our treatment. Yeah. So she proposes three different stages in treatment. The first is stabilization. This is a bit like um, seeking safety. It's like the same kind of model as seeking safety. Um, developing resources for stabilization. So we're explicitly teaching them relaxation skills, grounding skills. Um, we are co-regulating with them, establishing safety in the relationship, right? And rapport. Um, trying to knock out some of the more acute stressors in their life so they're not going to be doing their trauma treatment and then suddenly they're evicted or they're whatever comes up, right? Um, but actually instead using the current stressors in life as the test studies, the case studies to stabilize with, to practice all of those grounding and containment skills by addressing all of the current stressors, yeah? Which we kind of, it's almost like intuitively do this. Yeah, until we feel like we're ready, it's safe enough that we can start processing. Um, processing is a bit like desensitization, where we're able to actually start facing towards the previously dissociated material, whether or not it's the, the affect, the sensations, the explicit knowledge or concepts or images. Um, we're, you know, we have to have that kind of bring it on attitude at this point, where it's like, okay, we've got our, our kit, we've got our tools, we're ready to start facing the, the stuff. I think this, it was trying to like, um, get ready. <laughs> get ready, it's gonna be a doozy on a, a commute. Um, uh, I was trying to um, align this with IFS and, and the stages of treatment, and I'm kind of having a bit of a tricky time, but certainly stabilization is becoming friends with an, uh, and restoring the sense of self, right? And like ma magnifying their qualities of curiosity, of compassion, of clarity, calm, right? So that when we start processing, I think that's when we start aligning with the managers, although we might be doing that stabilization too. Yeah, right? So it doesn't really map on accurately. I'm not gonna spend all presentation on that. That's where I'm going, okay. And then finally, integration, the final phase, it's that it's now something that's a part of our past, right? It's not something that is no, it's no longer haunting us as actively. It still can pop up. We can still have flashbacks, but it's not as disturbing anymore. It's just an associative memory that still has some charge. And I know that I'm not there, and it's not appropriate for the situation. And I can manage that. I have the skills to manage that and still stay engaged with my life. I don't have to avoid situations anymore. It's a really great, promising, um, practice, right? Okay, so we're going to kind of go step by step through that, those three three tiers of, of how we're treating. Yeah, we're doing good. Okay. So the first one is just some explicit resources. We've already done some together at the beginning. Um, and the next uh, techniques for the therapist to practice when you're in the room with a patient to enhance it. This is called shuttling. And then with shuttling, we're going to learn how to do some body reading and, uh, and then practice contact statements that include uh, what we notice when we, when we are reading the body, uh, noticing in their body. And then finally, just a, kind of a quick little introduction to pendulation and, and titration from uh, Peter Levine's work, Sensory uh, Somatic Experiencing. Yeah? Cool. Um, there's a little kid with a little dingy thingy, and uh, he's running about her. He's being safe because he's got a floaty, right? Uh, we want to be safe too, we want to have our floaties, and we don't want to learn how to swim when the boat sinks. I say that a lot with my patients. It's like, cool, so you learn these skills, don't wait until like the alarm bells run. We gotta have some fire drills, we gotta like practice this. So that when the time comes, they're ready for us, they're rehearsed, they're waiting in the wings to come out and support us. Yeah. So, kind of like we're updating their their managers. We're trying to uh, support the self to be able to learn how to manage when the exile gets activated rather than the managers and the, and the firefighters to give them alternative. So, um, 
we did some of these, let me just quickly um, move on. So orientation, it's, it's really quick. We can just look around the room. Um, and by looking around the room and twisting our neck, just the physiological act of me turning my neck around and actually activating my spatial awareness. I'm looking at the, the space that I'm in, uh, the colors, the shapes, the where I am located compared to where you're located, what would the bird look like if it was looking through the ceiling, where would we all be? Right? All of that kind of um, ensures that we're safe. Yeah, it sends a signal to the body, yo, I looked, there's nothing, there's no threat. Right, you can literally just look under the, you know, I'm sure the OCD folks would love this one, so I give you a warning on that. I'm gonna keep looking, you know? <laughs> yeah. But it's good because physiologically, we can get frozen in that, um, freeze, faint zone, and stop looking for threats. Right, we just, we're just rigid, locked in. Okay, 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 can come any time. But instead, we're gonna, we're gonna relax and actually use our neck to look around. Is there actually a threat? Okay, come on, like, check it out. You know that, that um, it's like that kind of uh, cliche thing that happens in horror films, where like the, um, you know, the, the kind of idiot, you know, is, is like, <gasps> and they get frozen and something's behind them, but they can't look, you know, they can't look or whatever it is, and it's like, just turn around, is it, yeah, it's bad, run, you know, like, just look, it's bad, run, get out of there. <laughs> they can't, because they're, they're, they're stuck in this, this freeze. So, um, I, I recommend that we help with our dissociative patients who are really highly dissociative, create cue cards for different places where they feel activated dissociate that give them a menu of different uh, things to notice in each place. So if we're in the doctor's office and I always get activated in the doctor's office because at one time this thing happened, I'm instead going to say, okay, well look at the paintings on the wall in the doctor's office. Describe them to yourself. What's happening in those? Count how many chairs there are. How many magazines are there? What are the colors in the magazines? Right? Get really specific about the details. And that can help a patient really locate themselves in the present moment and orient themselves to safety. I'm fine. I, I can look around. I'm safe. Yeah, signaling into the mind that uh, there's no threat. I even made a little doctor's office for you. We practice the prolonged uh, duration of the exhale. So this particular breathing exercise. Gosh, there's like. Every type of breathing exercise under the sun exists, right? The, the benefit of doing prolonged exhale, where we're really focusing on trying to uh, extend the duration of the out-breath, is that every time we breathe out, our parasympathetic nervous system is activated. Every single time we breathe out, and every single time we breathe in, <gasps> I'm going to my sympathetic nervous system. So if I could put more focus and more duration just on exhaling, I'm doing myself a world of good and bringing myself back into that rest and digest social engagement nervous system. Yeah. Optimally, we want to be in a good balance of both, and we can breathe in and out normally, but with equal duration. You know what I mean? So that we can have a, a balance. It's healthy to have a balance, but most of our traumatized patients are not going to have a balance. Their sympathetic is run away, supercharged. So we need to give them these techniques to really extend the, the duration of the exhale. Yeah. I like the straw breathing, this little animated cartoon. Um, and when the trauma-focused CBT, which is used a lot in Medi-Cal child therapy, um, they explicitly teach the therapist to lay down in the therapy office with a cup on their belly and to show their, their, their client how the belly expands and contracts when you breathe. Right, and that's it's fun. Kids love it. Oh my God, the therapist is on the ground. I've done that with patients, adult patients, and they like it too. So it's, it's just a weird convention. Okay, I'm gonna get out of a chair. I'm gonna lay down and put a cup on my why a cup? It could be anything. Um, cool. Okay, so to shoveling, this is a, a nuts and bolts like somatic psychotherapy 101 technique. Be cool if we had a little longer. We could practice it here together. Um, That'll be done. So we're going to just talk about it. Um, we shovel our attention back and forth between our own physiological experience, what we notice our sensations to be, the affect and emotions where we're feeling the charge in our body, and then don't even pay attention to the client at that time. Just don't even put a thought to them. You can let your eyes rest on them, because that would be kind of rude. Um, 
but you're really directing all of your attention to noticing your own physiology, your own arousals and sensations in the body. And then you notice it good. Shuttle back to theirs. What do you notice in their body? How are they breathing? What's, are, they, are they moving? Are they stiff? Are they relaxed and loose? What are the patterns of their, of their body when they're talking? Right? All of that, and then good, we notice that, and we shuttle back to our own, just noticing our own sensations, our breath. It's so simple. Meanwhile, we're all quite verbal, so it's not like we're missing the content of what they're talking about. Right? It's still going to come in, we're going to hear it. But we're just directing our attention to notice the sensations in our body and their body, and our body and their body, back and forth, back and forth. It's a really good way to not become overwhelmed with our counter-transference. Right? Because we're going to notice it really early if we do that. We notice the early early antecedents of the particular, you know, grand mall counter-transference. Yeah. But it's also going to help us relate with them. We might notice that there's some mirroring going on or some um, empathic attunement where we might catch something in our own body of their experience before they notice it themselves. Right? So my heart might start sinking. My jaw might start clenching. Right? My pelvic floor might start clenching. Anything. We don't, we don't see anything else from them. Nothing's changed. But then you might get curious. Hey, I'm wondering what's happening. You, what you notice in your body right now as you say that. And they go, oh yeah, I'm tightening there. Oh, interesting. Let's get curious about that. And boom, we're in. Right, what's there? <coughs> so that gets into a lot more like esoteric realm. This is not Somatics 101. I still find this to be extraordinary. People, a lot of us are intuitive, and it could be intuitive, but there are some people out there who have mapped out the particulars of what every little body signal and sign means and what it could have correlations to how we organize our, our, our lives and our experience. It's really hard to read them, sorry. But you can check out Bodella um, and Body Dynamic Therapies. Came out of Reich and Kellerman and all the structural work, right? Um, I mean, this is really cool. So just even looking at these little parietal muscles in the bottom of the calf here, and they're associated with just our balance and group interaction. Right? Just it gets that specific. Um, my first supervisor was a Badala uh, therapist, and she told me about the elbows. This, these elbows here, all about boundaries and making space in a group. Get away from me. Oh, get away. Like if anyone's been to a crowded concert before, whew, um, elbows are like a real big deal, right? At any crowded concert where you really have to make space for yourself. How are they organizing their elbows? Are they, do they just drop by their side? Do they, are they active when they talk? You know? um, all of that we can notice. So, good. Even here it says that there's the, like if we have our shoulders always up, there may be a belief associated with that I'm always in danger, right, or a quality of fear. And in that we start getting clued into how much material we were missing when we weren't paying attention to the body. It's a ton. You know, Bessel van der Kolk says it's the, it holds the score, right? And really by orienting ourselves directly to how they're organizing physiologically, we're, we're looking at how they're, how maybe 80% of themselves is organizing experience. You know, the other 20% is the verbal that we're able to talk about in, in CBT, right? So when we do notice something, say, hey, when you're talking about that, I noticed that you stopped breathing afterwards. Um, it's nothing new. We do contact statements all the time with our patients about their thoughts and their feelings. All the time, oh, it's sad, huh? I'm feeling sad here. Or that, like how humiliating and defeating that must have been for you, huh? Right? Just simple contact statements that show that we're there, we're listening, and to bring attention to something, their experience. Um, so all we're doing here is just trying to add somatic contact statements into our already developed contact statement practice. So it seems like your body's tensing when you say that. Um, as you say those words, your hand's curling up into a fist. Huh, I wonder what that's about. Yeah, bring our, our quality of curiosity to that. And then that's going to clue us into their transference onto us. So we might notice that our patient is always on the front of the couch, sitting on the edge of the couch, 
and they're maybe on the weight is on the balls of their feet, and you know they're kind of tilted away from us. Curious. I wonder, you know, uh, what that's about, about how they're relating with us. Are they really feeling safety with us? I mean, truly, are they really feeling safety if they're about to run out the room? You know, um, or another patient who just lays on the couch and slovenly disregard for your pillows. They go everywhere. You know, and shoes on the you know favorite blanket. Or whatever. Um, what does that mean about <laughs> how they're treating us in the room? Right. Of course, these are all these nonverbal signs we're used to tracking. But then, vice versa, we also want to track our own. How are we called into response? What posture are we in chronically with this patient? It's probably going to be different than the other patients. And that might give us something. I wonder if a lot of people are like this with that. They elicit this from a lot of people in their life. Yeah. Or I wonder if there's a part of them in exile that feels like I do in this posture. Yeah. So we can get a lot of information by just doing that shuttling exercise back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as we use contact statements, we're developing the client's sophistication in tracking their embodied experience so that eventually they're just like the self is slowly running the show, the client's slowly running the show and understanding how they're uh, organizing experience outside the room. Hey, I noticed, you know, when I was with my friends and they said this thing, I went, I just, I just drooped. I drooped and I didn't have anything to say. It, you know, it reminded me of how my dad used to criticize me. Ah, good, there you go, you're tracking it, right? And sometimes it's just as simple as noticing the shift in posture, and, oh right, I used to do that growing up. That's, that's very familiar. I, Oh, just shut down. Yeah. Um, another fun technique comes directly out of Pat Ogden's work, but I think Hakomi does this too, somatic experiencing does this, neuroaffective relational model does this, a lot of the somatic people, and gosh, Gestalt does, I mean, like, this is nothing new. Um, we want to do experiments. Yeah, try on new behaviors, also just try on saying things, new skills, and see what happens in the room. Uh, but we want to do it in mindfulness, like we did at the beginning of our uh, practice. Okay, we do. So, one I do with the patient, the one who sits on the front of the couch, um, I asked her first, let's establish mindfulness. We did a little bit of mindfulness practice. Notice our sensations, our emotions, our thoughts, and breath, and then just settle on the breath. Okay, I'm noticing just this neutral space you're in right now. I just want you to say the word, no. Okay, try it again. No. And then, boom. My, my throat broke. My, my voice cracked. My, my heart sank. I didn't feel strong there. Cool. So what would happen if you were to just try throwing your, your chest out a little bit more? What would happen if you, you brought your chest forward, stood up a little straighter? Okay, now try it again. What would happen if you say no? No. Ah, there you go, there's forte behind it. You know, you got some force. And boom, chaos demonstrato, right? It's like done, and they can maybe get it. When I'm not, when I'm asserting my boundaries, I'm not really asserting them. You know, you can teach them the words and language all you want, but if they're still cowering underneath it, they're not gonna. Or she really needed, this is a particular client that Lori and I um, work together with, um, that helped, I think, this current treatment episode happen is that she said, uh, we were working with, I need help. Please help. I need help. Yeah? Oof, that one just brought her to, she was just, oh, I never say that. I'm so autonomous. I'm so independent. I'm afraid of asking for help. Boom, 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 boom. But we can get it simply by establishing mindfulness and then finding these core organizing themes and trying them out. What's it like to say it? Notice how you organize in the body. Let's get curious about that. Cool, and then I listed some other processing models. We're familiar with, uh, I brought up um, SE and EMDR. And the basics here of EMDR is that it's doing what I think Pat Ogden's doing here, but accelerating it through the, the power of this bilateral stimulation. Yeah, it's just activating the neocortex to organize the material faster, or would, as normally normatively would be happening during dreams, or REM sleep, and um, getting that stuck material in the middle of the brain that is in the freeze and the faint and the fight and the flight, and allowing the neocortex to organize it just by stimulating 
back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between the lobes of the brain. Yeah? Um, Any thoughts or questions? Keep digging. Okay. So I'm going to talk about Peter Levine in a way that I hope would make him proud. Um, I'm going to speak up. So uh, Peter Levine says the nervous system is like a slinky, right? And at times it's quiet and sometimes it's loud, and it should be able to bounce up and down and up and down normatively. Blah, 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 blah. It's like um, Mark when he was, was it like a puppy? Yeah. <laughs> Got to get you some kind of dig back, Mark. Um, and uh, you might be fighting, you know, woo, right? Hopefully it's organized, it's not like that. We're going to be fighting. You might be running. We might be whispering to a friend or writing in our diary, right? Um, and what happens with the freeze or faint is all of this energy gets caught slammed into the slinky. And it's like we got this vice around it that keeps it tight in there. Yeah, our job is not to allow it to just to just to just volcano out. I, see, I think he'd be proud. I don't know. Good. 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 Really, they went for that. Um, but instead, to just eke it out, little by little, 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 until they have their nervous system back. They have their life back. Yeah. I love this. Thing. Anybody want to have this thing? I love it. So that's the idea of of titration, like we're in chemistry class again, dropping the solution, not trying to over uh, saturate the solution, just drop by drop by drop. We're tracking their physiological since the uh, signals of their body. We're noticing our counter-transferential signals from our body and to know that, okay, this is it. We don't want to push them any further. It's time to instead pendulate to swing our attention over to a calm and safe place or resource, right? All the different schools have different particular ways of doing their calm and safe place. Um, but it's really important to be able to establish something where we can actively dissociate together. We're going to distract, but it's going to be a healthy, adaptive way of distracting. Right? Let's talk about that time you played with the horses. Or let's talk about that meditation retreat you did on the mountaintop. Or let's talk about the snowball fight you had with your, your whatever. Like to, or let's come to the base of our feet and notice the sensations on the bottom of our feet. Good. What do you... What kind of sensations do you feel there? Yeah? I think I'm going to wrap up. Um, there's a few more slides here about desentification and integrative capacity. I think the one thing I need to say, why don't we look at integration here? Um, that third phase, thanks for your patience and for sitting all day. Um, is that we can recognize when the exile is activated and take care of it. Yeah? We can recognize when we're activated and manage it and still stay present in our life, knowing that that's something different. That's in the past. Still, still activating, still stressful, but we got it. We can handle it. So uh, this is a nice example right out of uh, Ogden's book. So the client who experiences panic symptoms um, I will not scream. The client who experiences panic symptoms when men get on an elevator with her must learn to discriminate her internal experience, the racing heart, the constricted breathing, the feelings of fear from her current external reality that these men are her own colleagues, like liked and well known to her, and there are other people in the elevator. She's able, she has the skills to protest. She's got an active fight or flight response if she should need it to keep her safe, right? Um, and why not another example? So this one's really nice. Um, given the negative feedback in a supportive manner by a coworker, she instinct instinctively cowered without realizing it. It was an artifact from her childhood abuse. Even when it was a supportive feedback, she was getting triggered into this cowering stance. So she reported interpreting this incident as an angry attack, although she knew intelli intellectually that this was not the case. So I think this is my biggest take home here. I'll finish it. Her integrative capacity was undermined 
as her cringing body posture rendered her unable to interpret or respond appropriately to the present moment, no matter how much she told herself she was not in danger. To overcome this distorted and inaccurate mixing of past and present, she had to learn how to orient away from the trauma-related stimulus and toward her sensory motor experience. So instead of cringing, she learned how to stand tall, right? The alternative response that was unable to be uh, fulfilled when she was being abused, right? So I tell my patients a lot, like, you know, your body's sending you these signals and your mind's gonna do its best to rationalize them, to make sense of it, right? And if it's stuck in there, if the trauma's still stuck in there, if I'm still cowering, my mind's gonna be like, oh, there's something to cower about. I'm gonna look for something to cower about. I'll give you a thousand reasons why you're being abused right now, right? To make sense of that signals coming from below. So we need to address the signals coming from below to have an alternative response. Otherwise, we're gonna be stuck with these panic attacks that don't make any sense. How am I panicking? Why am I keep breaking down in tears? Why do I keep, uh, like we're organizing that experience phys physiologically and we need to learn how to respond differently to it. Yeah. Cool. Um, so review and any questions? <laughs> Thoughts? Inspirational quotes? Yeah. You said at one point, um, you said that there was stabilization. And the last one was integration. What was that middle one? Processing. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, containing the current uh, storm of dysregulatory mess that we have going on, the, um, the use of all the old coping mechanisms and um, firefighters and, and managers, and learning other ways to cope in a more adaptive manner so that we can then turn towards the stress and actually bear even more intensity as we then go into the next phase of processing, of facing all that old stuff, right? And then finally, we should be able to have a new friendly, um, inviting, welcoming, self-filled uh, relationship with that previously exiled material, and then move into the third phase of integration where we then turn back towards our life and figure out how we can live again and engage in things that we've, we've kept uh, away, yeah? Yeah. Um, do you uh, make the patient aware of your methods before they start with you, or you wait until a, a, a moment comes up and then you convert them to this? Yeah, again, it depends on the patient, right? Yeah. Um, so you're like, don't start every session with something of this order necessarily. You're just seeing what happens. That's right. Yeah, I still want it to be a client directed treatment. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. I think, um, like uh, in Hakomi, it's a, they use a systems theory um, principle called organicity. Um, and the idea is that if all the different parts of an organism are in communication with all the other parts, then it'll naturally heal. Right? Just there's this natural quality of life to heal when all the parts are, are in harmony. Yeah? So our work is just to simply attend to that and bring the uh, splintered parts back into the fold. And the clients are gonna bring, bring that up. Yeah. Or they won't, then we'll have to call them on it, but gently. <laughs> okay. Cool. And uh, thank you so much. I, I hope you take care of yourselves and your bodies uh, tonight, this weekend. It's a pleasure. Cheers.